Okay, all right. Hello and welcome back to the Make Lemonade podcast, the show for creators by creators where we hope to inspire others to earn money from their own lemonade stand. I'm on your co-host James and I'm back here with JR Farr, co-founder and CEO of Lemon Squeezy. In this episode, we're going to be talking all things shipping at Lemon Squeezy, why they ship fast without breaking things, building simple, lovable, complete features rather than MVPs and everything that's involved in their shipping process. I'm enjoying JR lifting up the curtain on the behind the scenes of a rapidly growing startup up and being candid in the way that he's sharing things this is a great episode let's get into it okay jr we're back with another make lemonade episode so just to intro us to the topic why is it that shipping fast matters to you at lemon squeezy yeah i know and it's i know i was the one that kind of brought this topic today but it's important to me because i think you know there's a lot of conversations around building products the mvp And I think there's a common misconception when it comes to the MVP work because, you know, like the old Facebook mantra was move fast and break things. And I don't know if, you know, we were just talking about this. It's not the best thing for the customer. And my favorite one is the one from Jason Cohen from WP Engine, which is called SLC, which is simple, lovable, and complete. And even if it's the most simplistic product to start if it's complete and feels like it does a job or solves a pain end to end you can build on top of that right and make it lovable from the start as opposed to feeling buggy or you know what i mean like typically what a what an mvp could feel like and it just i think it's this this episode we can talk about going into something like the payment space and everything that we've done with lemon squeezy And kind of what we had to take on and how we thought about early days of the V1 and how we went about the the SLC approach. And I guess as you move forward after you launch, right, we're what, like two and a half years in since we launched the public now, been working on it for maybe three, three and a half years. But now it's like, why I, I'm a true believer that like shipping fast matters because it all comes down to one thing that's the most important, which is consistency. So if you have consistency in your in your tweeting, you know, your blog post, and obviously you're shipping on your features, like the consistency is what wins over time, right? So that's like a point that I really want to call out and how to help people maybe ship faster with that SLC approach. This SLC approach is not something I'd heard of, and I can't believe this isn't adopted more in the community of people that are building stuff because We all hear about MVPs and how you want to get to your MVP and get that launched out the door as quick as you can. And what that ends up is with these like almost half-baked products. But what Jason Cohen talks about with these simple, lovable, complete products is exactly that. They're simple. You don't go beyond what you think you need. So you get that minimum side of it and like not a half-baked product. Did you know about this? as you were launching Lemon Squeezy at the start? No, I think it's just more of my own thing, you know, of years of building startups and products and and not just like, you know, bootstrapped products, but also, you know, before where I was at a public company, we were doing a billion five yeah. in revenue and shipping at that level too, right? And how to make how to make all the red tape, you know, and constraints that you have to work with there. So I think I've just kind of learned it over the the years of of working on this stuff that I found my own rhythm that seems to work and it, it aligned so closely with what Jason did that you know he he's pretty elegant with his words so it's a little easier to just like lean on what his example is but it's it's basically the same thing for me. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned consistency. I wonder like if you're consistently shipping out more and more and more features does this not lead to bloat in your product and just having too many features that leads to something confusing no well i think again it's like that's a misconception right you don't just have to ship features but even just what's we talk a lot about this at lemon squeezy which is quality of life improvements so existing features that just get a nice little touch up right or a different type of you know, quality, you know, surprise and delight features that might happen when you push a button and it does something different or, you know, just making even just like our webhook testing, there's like a whole module that pops out and you can just this, the experience 
we didn't change, we didn't add a new feature with webhooks. We just enhanced it. And there's things like that that I think you can spend time on to make the simple, lovable, complete product you have just that much better, right? Yeah. And on that subject too, it's that leads into how do I prioritize what I build? What do I take in from the customer versus what I think my gut tells me? And I think that there's another part of this conversation that I want to have, which talks about, I think there's different stages in a company where how you ship and what you ship, you know, fast is always the thing here, right? Just don't get tied down with huge branches or huge features that just sit there. Right. And, and before you've shipped it, it, it's taken you six months. We've actually ran into that. Like we're not perfect. And I will talk about something that we did that we got stuck in that and what kind of happened. But I think, what is that Henry Ford quote? He's like, if, if people told me what they wanted, I would have built a faster horse, right. As opposed yep. to a car. Right. So you kind of have to have your own gut early on of what you're building and what pain you're solving. And that's why you typically it's good to solve for something that it's a pain you have. And then from there, you kind of prioritize, you know, you balance what you want versus what your feet, you know, the customers are asking for. But so how do you decide what features to build or is or do we want to go down there? Like, how did you build Lemon Squeezy in, at the start? Let's talk a little bit more about like why shipping fast matter. So we've talked about, you know, the consistency side of things. But I think there's also like this. So one of the. I've talked about our core values at Lemon Squeezy, which are silly to some people, but one of them is ownership, right? And I think what this does is when people have the ability to own like a feature or a quality of life improvement or whatever, it there's this concept of like internal conviction and internal wins, right? That start to build and compound. We have these tiny teams, which typically is an engineer uh, and a designer, and then maybe someone on the product side. So there's kind of like this this triangle, that's typically how something gets out the door at a high level with lemon squeezy. But the reason why that's important is you have this ownership that's built in right away. And so that when something gets pushed out, this is why it matters, right? Because as you're shipping fast, the team is building this momentum of wins and conviction around the product of like, I feel like we're yeah. improving. I feel like we're getting better. I feel like our customers are happier and it's, you know what I mean? Just so over the months and then the year, that has snowballed into something much bigger, right? Does that sort of avoid you getting stuck on one feature that... Yeah. And like, how how do you make sure it's simple, lovable, complete, and not just a feature that keeps growing and growing and growing? And like an example of this for you, JR, is the affiliate feature. For you, you built almost a, an entirely new platform that could be a standalone platform for affiliates. Mm -hmm. Is that something that was briefed at the start? Because that's not simple. That's hugely complex. Yeah. And we, kind of hard to ship fast. Yeah, we kind of, we take a little bit of the shape up playbook from Basecamp, which is this concept of an appetite. How big is your appetite for this particular feature? So in your case, you know, like you just said, affiliates. In the very beginning, we talked about the appetite that we wanted to take on for this. And in us, it was, for us, it was, you know, appetite from design, appetite from engineering, and that kind of, you know, correlates into, all right, this is going to take this many weeks or months to get this shipped. And we knew that's a different one or an interesting one because that feature is very, a, a very differentiating feature. So our appetite was much, we were way more hungry for that, right? Like we wanted to make sure that we nailed that. And it was something that we could build on and improve over the years to make it better and better. So, and to your point of what you're kind of teeing up, I think how do you know and what do you do? I, again, this goes back to the stage that your company's in. In the very beginning, I believe that you can go out there and do research. You should talk to customers. But there's also a balance of like, this is what, I, because I've experienced this pain, in our case, Lemon Squeezy, we spent over a decade selling digital products. So we knew all of the pain. And there was things that we, when we sat down in 2020, we realized there's just a lot of platforms that don't have some of the things that we would want. And so we sat down and in the very beginning and we prioritized what we would want. We built the product more for us. And I think from there, then you give it six months or however long to kind of, you know, complete that and make that better how you want it. And I feel like that's when we kind of started to balance the feedback from the customers 
versus what we wanted initially, right? And that's how it's morphed out. And we have things now where you can suggest features. And if you go to that, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of votes on just one feature. And so now we're actually mm. prioritizing based off of that because the people have spoken, right? You've got that many people voting on one feature. It's pretty obvious that you need to build that feature, right? So we, well, we're, But we're at that yeah. stage. We have that luxury now, you know, and you have to kind of work towards that. What do you use for your roadmap? It's custom. Our roadmap feature is custom. That's the roadmap is different, but we we use Nolt.io for our feature suggestion, where people can come in and add, you know, things, and and it's nice because you can merge duplicate kind of feature requests, and then there's voting and commenting, and so yeah, on the site there's a suggest a feature section that you can go and see all the things, and you can sort by trending and sort by most voted, and and then like for example. To take it a step further, once we've chosen something like bundles and upsells, that's a huge thing that people want. I've taken mock-ups from the design team and I've started to go after our, you know, some of our higher end VIP type merchants and said, Hey, this is this this is what we're thinking. This is some initial early mock-ups. What do you think? Does this solve your pain? Is there anything that we're missing? What it, what use cases are we maybe not thinking about particularly for you? And so that's been really helpful as well. But, you know, this goes back into just early on and you have those tiny teams, like that's really helpful because you don't have context switching with the design team and the engineering team. They're just thinking about this one feature and getting out the door. And that can take Mm -hmm. a few days or it could take a few weeks and then they're off to the next thing. So So how does it work with your teams like how are you deciding every week every are you doing quarterly cycles weekly monthly how are you breaking it down and assigning teams to features because that sounds like hugely complex to me (laughs) does it really (laughs) i actually yeah because i feel like compared to where i've been in the past ours is actually pretty simple and maybe that's why it's working for now but the so the way so we've gone through a few things we've we've taken some pages out of shape up we've taken some pages from you know other way like sprinting right two week sprint cycles we've tried that one week sprint cycles right now where we really have found our rhythm is monthly cycles like four week cycles i like this because the way that we are set up at lemon squeezy is you know every month we kind of have this all hands meeting we review the last month what happened And then we kind of kick off like where we're headed in the next four weeks, but we also spend time to talk about where we're going to be in the next four months and even the next years, right? Of This is where we're going, guys. This is why this stuff in the next month cycle makes sense because it's going to get us ready for the next four months, which by the way, stuff that's in the the cycle now is teeing us up for the lemon squeezy marketplace that's going to happen in January, February, March of 2024. So there's a lot Mm -hmm. of stuff in the current cycle that's getting us ready to unveil that so you'll start to see us teasing that here soon which is another one of those affiliate type features but we have a big appetite for the marketplace so but yeah like four week cycles 50 percent of our work in that cycle is planned the other 50 percent is unplanned and that's because there's support tickets there's maintenance there's quality of life things like if you follow me on twitter you'll see over the weekend i think ash allen is his name he pinged me and said he pinged me on twitter and said Lemon squeeze. I got a feed. I got some feedback. I have 167 discount codes. I need to filter those. So I posted <laughs> it in Slack on like a Saturday, and one of our engineers picked it up, fixed it, did it, and I wrote back and I took a screenshot. And I said, "How's this?" And I think someone from GitHub or Copilot, or I can't remember his name's Ryan. I think he was like, "Holy shit! Like, how's that for like a fast turnaround?" But that's because 50 percent of our work is unplanned, so the engineers have time to pick things up like that that's that's important so i think that's like a that's a little piece in the cycle planning that that helps us you know stay agile how do you do estimates on time it will take for to build a feature because i am typically terrible at estimating how much time something takes like the more you do it the more you get an understanding right but the features change in terms of their scope and how complex it is. And do you have to revisit them regularly to sort of yeah. extend the or change the scope or extend the timeline a feature is going to take? It starts early. So the scoping early on is what really makes it 
easy to estimate. So when I, what I mean by that is, you know, let's take the upsells, right? So if we're breaking down the upsell feature, you've got to factor in, okay, we need to talk to some customers. We need time for design. We need time for engineering. We need time for QA. We need time for docs. That's kind of how we, we have them in those little buckets, right? And it's easy because it'll say Orman or Liam will come in and say, okay, from a design perspective, uh, this is going to take me three days, right? Or a week, yeah. right? So now all of a sudden you've got everything broken out, you put it all together, and now you've got a pretty, pretty good estimate of like what this is going to take. And then that says, and then we go back to the last question, which is, is this too big for our appetite or is it just right? And then we kick it off with those tiny teams. And how do you leave that 50% give or take extra time for the unplanned stuff is there a point in which you, like everyone is full up with work that they've got to do uh, like you've hit that threshold that you've set allowed that time for other things is that when you need to hire and what if you've not got the revenue to hire i mean i think we've 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 done a good job and we've done a bad job at this i think this is the benefit of us you know back to the last episode we haven't taken funding yet Right. And, and a part of that is like, it does, it does give us these force constraints that we are, we have to work in mm -hmm. as opposed to maybe some, you know, over the top stuff that we don't need to worry about. And I, it, I think when we go into those planning meetings early on, you want to be really ambitious, but you also have to be realistic. And I think what we've found is early on, there was times where we'd go into those cycles and we would say, oh yeah, we can do all this. Right. And then we realized quickly like okay we've been off way more than we can chew so now i think we've gotten to a point where we actually are pretty realistic with okay we're just going to take these three things and and that's it because it's that's the thing right when in doubt just ship something so you gotta can't get stuck in analysis paralysis try to keep it simple if if we have time for the extra stuff and so so think about it like this there's six things that we want to get done we know for sure we can get three. We'll keep the six in there if there's time, but we have to make sure there's time for the unplanned work. So we'd rather mm -hmm. err on that side, you know? Yeah. It's pretty cool that you got something shipped that quickly, like over a weekend, quick fix. But think about mentioned... what that does for think about what that does for the team, right? Like over the weekend, everyone's watching this in Slack. The even if it's just a few people on Twitter that saw it, like for them. That was a huge win for us. That was a huge win, you know, like I, calling out the person that did it on the team. It, there's that internal conviction. There's that momentum. There's the consistency that's compounding. And you know what I mean? You're, you're, you're seeing the cycle. Of shipping yeah. Fast. You know what I don't like though? That it's done over the weekend. Well, <laughs> yeah. that, that, no, that, 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 I think for some people listening, they'll be like, why is, why are your developers working over the weekend? That screams like, yeah. are you pushing them too hard that they're, no, on we a, don't. Online but that's at the weekends. Thing. That's the thing is, I didn't say that though. I didn't say, "Can someone work on this?" I just posted it and said, "I just literally posted the link inside of our product channel as feedback." Yeah, that's it. I didn't say work on this. No, and I, I actually think we're pretty. We're actually the opposite. I think that we're we've cl we clearly haven't taken the money because we're not trying to build a rocket ship. We're not trying to kill ourselves. Yeah. Not trying to burn ourselves out. Everyone takes vacation. Everyone takes time off. You know, I think it's just some people feel like, oh, yeah, I just, I'm bored. I want to get on this. Or it, we might have a little bit of that. We're building something that people are really excited about. It's not required. It's not forced. It's not. But I love that you called me out on that because yeah. people can do that. But it's, I would just honestly, like, we do not, we do not push that for sure. And, and, and I am probing because it's something yeah. I noticed, but as someone who has worked with you for the past few months, it is clear that you're not pushing people to do that. You're happy to extend deadlines where needed. You're a people person. Yeah. I do want to make that clear, but <laughs> just in case people were wondering if you're on people, you must fix this bug over the weekend. It's <laughs> definitely not like that. Yeah. Um, so how are you making sure that the features that you're building are good quality and hit that bar that you're known for now and like what is that process of testing a feature and making yeah. sure you're not putting it out with a handful of bugs yeah i mean i don't know i mean it depends on what day you ask me some days you ask me i might say <laughs> oh we we could be better but it's software right like you're you're gonna have bugs you're, you're gonna have things like that i think 
you know, with affiliates and like usage based billing, the metered billing feature, you know, we have the ability obviously to do feature flags. So we'll, re we'll release something internally, then we'll release it to, you know, high level merchants that are asking for the feature, which could be 10 or a hundred. Right. And then we'll roll it out to the, you know, another 500. And then we kind of feel like it's, it's hardened or stable, then we'll, we'll release it. But that's not to say that our process is perfect. I do, you know, we have a decent, strong QA process. I know G, I, I call him G Gilbert, our CTO. He is doing a lot with like unit testing. I actually think our, I can't remember what he said the other day, but on the checkout flow, for example, when we release something, I want to say it does like 17,000 unit tests or checks before it rolls out. Like it's pretty elaborate and it's automated and it checks against all those things, right? Because that is really critical. So, you know, invest, I think it's investing in those boring things like that, that help. Right. And then just, if it's a big change to your code base, you know, that internally, you need to make sure that you're, you know, responsibly rolling this feature out. Right. Is, so. is it hard to keep people excited about like the sexy features versus the uh, not so sexy keeping the product going improvements that you might have to do? Like the team internally? Is that what I mean? Yeah. No, not really. I mean, I think I think people get a kick out of it. I think especially like some of the quality of life stuff is quick, quick wins and people feel accomplished. I, th I think that's good. And I think we do a decent job of rotating people. For, so, for example, like this this entire last half of last week and this week, I call it EOS, everyone on support. So the, 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 the idea is everyone gets into support. We knock the queue down, make sure it's stable. And it also creates empathy, right? So that everyone's listening to all the customers, and what they're complaining about. And then it starts to, it starts that concept of like quality of life where people are like, Oh yeah, I could, I can quickly fix this real quick. Let me just, pull up, do a pull request, get it approved and fix this feature. And I think, you know, I think people get excited because they feel like they've helped someone, you know, and it kind of just, again, builds that same consistency internally. So that's how I think about it. And it seems to work for us. And talking about the sort of the size of Lemon Squeezy, where it is at the moment, you see like solo builders shipping stuff so quickly and it feels like the bigger you get the harder it is to ship things because you've got a lot more cooks in the kitchen yeah so to speak and i always wonder jr like how do apple ship things yeah like they are so big how do they get all of these teams together at what level do they have to make decisions to actually build a physical product do you have any idea how it works? Like the oh, bigger man. you get? I mean, yeah, I do from my, but again, it's, see, this is the thing is like where I was at, at a company with Lemon Squeezy now where we're, you know, 15, getting to 20 people at a certain size of revenue, how we do it versus, you know, the last company I was with was public with, the, you know, 4,000 employees at a billion five. Uh, Apple's a whole nother level, right? <laughs> and so like back in the day, we had, product orgs and engineering orgs and they all kind of work together and we had kind of that same triangle idea where product product design and engineering all work together on a feature right and there were certain teams that own certain parts of the product that's a way to do it right so if you on our case someone could own domains someone could own email someone could own affiliates right we could actually have dedicated teams to make sure those are always improving that's one way to do it you could have more of the fighter teams, right? Like the growth fighter teams that are doing the new kind of sexy stuff, right? And you can break things out where you have the maintenance and core teams, feature teams, and you have like the fighter brand teams, right? So that's kind of how I've seen a lot of the bigger orgs do it and how we did it in the past. But again, it you know, it's, it's all relative. What does shipping fast really mean? It, it just depends on the size and what you, what you're doing. I think you want to stay consistent. Like I look at our change log on the site and when I look at that and I see one, two, three, four things, I feel like that's a good month of us releasing things at this, at this time. I think it keeps a consistent touch point. It's something to communicate with the customers about via email, right? Don't forget. It's one thing I've missed in the shipping thing is we do a decent job of tying together marketing and comms, right? So blog the, post, Twitter, This is going to be my next yeah. question. Do, do you have like someone in marketing within the team? Like a, would that be product marketing or, or, or like at the size of your org? Is there, 
only one or two people taking care of marketing. Yeah. Who, is, who does take care of it's marketing? It's the latter. Is it's, it you? It's me and Orman. And we're right now, that has been the thing is, okay, our next hire is going to be a marketing, a head of marketing. But we, t- we got to marry that, right? And because there is like, you'll see us a lot like teasing things. You got to get the build. You got to build the anticipation, the excitement about this thing coming. And then, and, then it re- and then it releases. And now you've got, you know, updating that. So I think... For us, again, what, what makes sense in my mind for the size of our organization is we work in these monthly four-week cycles, and I think that allows us to work within a big enough time frame where we can ship something meaningful, and even if it's little, and get those out, get the change log updated, knock things off the roadmap, get the email, the tweets that keeps the cadence with our customers, and then it also gets the internal conviction in the team where they feel like they're consistently pushing some, something out. And if you think about it, I, like, for, for example, the marketplace is coming. That'll be a huge email marketing, affiliate marketing type feature. We're going to have to pull someone off and almost silo them. Like, for example, that'll be like, you know, Gilbert and Orman. Just you guys are going to be on this. The rest of the team needs to step up and keep the cycles running, right? And the comms running while those guys are trying to get that out, right? But, it, but at this size, right? Like I'm doing product, I'm doing marketing, I'm doing the business, I'm making sure, you know, our jurisdictions are set up in place for the compliance side of taxes and you know what I mean? So CEO, it's hard, to, it's hard for me to answer because for me, I feel like I've reached that point in the company where I just take all the hard, boring stuff, the stuff that's not working. I've got to go and solve that, right? Or that's the hard part about the CEO role as you get bigger is I, I saw a video with Elon the other day and he was he was saying being a CEO is like staring off to the abyss and eating glass, right? And it's just it's literally like that. You're just because you don't you don't no one wants to send you the good stuff. They just we need help with this issue or this problem here or this problem there. So I feel like the marketing stuff's fun, no? Oh, it's way fun. It's way fun. But but here's the problem. I actually, transparently, I feel like I've dropped the ball a little bit where I need to, I want to get back into that. I enjoy that. It's where I really like to be. But when you're dealing with all of the high level, deep problems like that, you're, you're drained from creativity. Like you almost, I almost have no brain power left to actually be creative and write words and, you know, be, that's where I'm excited about the podcast, James, is like, it's forcing me to sit down and give you notes and think about the topics and what we're going to discuss. And it's, it's getting me back into that, that consistency of rhythm of like creation. And that'll get me into a nice flow with the rest of the stuff I'm trying to do. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, I think dropping the balls a bit harsh (laughs) for, (laughs) for someone that's like doing all this stuff, but like, what would your advice be to you if you were like looking in and you have a CEO that is sort of, fighting a lot of these fires and dealing with all the business stuff, but kind of wants to get into marketing, what advice would you give to you? It probably comes down to like being in control of your schedule. So you, you, you'd be well served on your calendar, right? Or however you do it to do some deep blocks, two hour, three hour blocks, even if it's just every other day, right? Or every day, however, how much time you can afford. But I think that's honestly what it, you have to force yourself, turn things off, put a timer up on your desk or your computer and say, mm-hmm. I have 45 minutes right now and I'm going to, this is what I have to tackle. Eat the frog, right? Like that is the thing that I try to live by is like, I wake up and it's like, what is the hardest thing I need to do today? And I try and do that first. I try to eat the frog first so I can at least just get that hardest problem out of the way and then move on from there. So wait, 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 hold on. Isn't, isn't this the first thing you're doing today? No, I've been, no, it's, it's, it's 10 a.m. almost for me. I'm up early doing things, man. Cause I'm in America. So like, you know, half the teams in London and Scotland. And so, you know, they're up, I'm up early, always talking with them, doing calls. So what was your frog this morning? Sales tax compliance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. You, you wrote something in your notes that I want to ask you about. And that's if in doubt, ship something, try not to get stuck in analysis paralysis, but uh, kind of what we were talking about isn't the mentality of just shipping something in doubt. It's still making it simple, yes. uh, lovable, complete. Yes. But this suggests that you just ship something if you're stuck. I guess what I'm saying is, is when in doubt, maybe, yeah, maybe simplify it to get something shipped, right? It's okay if it doesn't have every bell and whistle, right? So 
Because you can and, iterate on features, right? Yes. Once you've and launched that is, said feature. People people have a really hard time with that. They feel like it's not going to be enough. But I actually think it's the right approach. And again, not saying that our values are great, but we have the three that are most important, which is ownership, execution, and craftsmanship. Craftsmanship comes from Ormond that I always talk about from the design side, the pixels, the you know, feeling like this is polished. So I think as long as you kind of have that keeping you in check where you're not being sloppy, but also not over engineering and over designing and over perfecting it. Right. So it's this balance. It's just life. It's like I love ice cream, but I can't eat ice cream all day cause I'll be sick. Right. But I can have it in balance. Right. So you've got to find that balance, but don't get stuck. Right. It's like, that's the point. Yeah. Cause at that point you lose the momentum, the, yeah, the momentum and consistency that you mentioned is so important to keeping things going for you. Mm -hmm. I, I just saw that I had a few questions responded back when we tweeted about this from some people. We should answer oh, those. You? you did. I yeah, think you did. Yeah. yeah. I got one. That was from Justin Jackson, co-founder of Transistor, responded with a question on the topic of shipping fast. And I'm curious to get your thoughts now. I know Justin will. He says, what does shipping fast look like practically for you? Is it one feature a week? Like what is determining your cadence and who is responsible for keeping that pace? Mm. He's a smart guy. <laughs> he's He's got good questions. He, he He's probably, I'd actually love to know his take on this too, because you know, they're, they're doing pretty well. So let me unpack these. Cause to go back a little, we're going to, I'm going to go in a little bit more into our process. So we have the four week cycle, the monthly cycle that gets planned. 50% is planned. 50% is unplanned. We use linear and we actually, we set up the cycle and these are the, these are the initiatives or these are the features. These are the product or the, the projects that we're going to release in October's release. So in terms of like shipping fast for us, it's just, it's more of Let's go, let's go to our appetite. What do we have room for? And it's, it's all about the consistency. When I say shipping fast and why it's important and why it matters is I can't understate this enough or overstate this enough, which is by shipping fast, you engage with your customers, right? Cause the comms comes out. So you stay steady. The team get, builds the internal conviction because of the consistency. They get the wins, they get the ownership, they get... And, and I also think it avoids the analysis paralysis where maybe you over engineer or over produce a product as opposed to the simple lovable complete version, version 0 0.1, then iterate based off of that. And I, I think, again, having that force constraint allows you to distill the product down, keep it simple, get it out the door and then iterate from there. So you have that consistency. So it's, it's, it's not so much the one feature a week. I think it's more of, okay, we have, we're looking at the, the feature requests that are coming in. We're looking at our, our existing backlog. We're looking at quality of life things. We do prioritization as a team, right? And then we could have a thing where there's eight things that cycle, right? So it's not so much shipping the once a week. It's just what's ready to go out during the cycle and we ship those things. So for example, I think today we're sending an email with a bunch of stuff that's recently been released. We, we bundle it all up and we do all of our announcements and things like that. And we tease things on Twitter that's coming. Wash, rinse, repeat, right? So the cycle is just steady Eddie. And I think that's the point. And, and to answer his last question, and then you can kind of ask me any follow-ups on this. Who's responsible? It's me. I am definitely like a product oriented CEO that likes to make sure that we're producing, we're, we're iterating, we're, you know, we're, we're doing the releases. So I am the one that's really trying to push on the pace. I'm pinging each one of the engineering or designers, right. And saying, where are we out on this? Are you on pace? Do you need more time? Did we over or underestimate this? That's kind of my job throughout the day, throughout the week, right. Is checking in on those things, balancing all that. When do you hire for that? Good question i think you know being the product oriented product led growth type company so so let's actually this is a great question there's marketing led growth there's sales led growth there's product led growth if you follow lemon squeezy we've clearly taken the product led growth path and i think that's great but i think that we're at a point where we feel like we should make sure that the platform is consistent support is lightning fast 
quality of life is there. We feel like we have a lot of the, the features outside of the marketplace that we need. And then we feel like we have the appetite of the things can, can hold off. So I think for us, where we're at to answer this is the demand. We feel like we've, we've, we've caught up with enough in terms of the engineering side, where I think marketing and, and sales is an area that we need to invest in. So it's a little tricky for me to answer right now, but my, my whole thing, and you know this, I am all about hiring when it hurts. I don't, I don't like any extra fat on the bone. I like to make sure that we are, when the pressure is hot, that's when we hire. So if we had just an unbelievable, which we do, but again, we're bootstraps. We have to be realistic. If we took the money, then yeah, I could, I could definitely say we need a ton of resources to build out the roadmap faster, but I think we've found a cadence that we like. So yeah, absolutely. Good answer. So just got another question on that we put on Twitter from Arvid Carl and Arvid's question is a little bit about open source. Now, I don't know much about open source, but he says, as a new Laravel learner and looking at the really cool Laravel integration that's being built, I wonder how you are prioritizing the staffing open source contributions. How important is that to the business? And is there a way to compete with bigger players who don't look at certain frameworks or communities? I love this question so much. I, I think because I come from the WordPress space. So how do we prioritize this? So uh, we got a little lucky with like, for example, Laravel. Dre's, you know, he built this for us. I did, you know, I did sponsor him as the company to, to keep that maintained and, and things like that. And we have a good relationship with him. So that has really helped. I think, you know, you look at some of the other integrations, I think it's all where we're at. We're lucky now where I think there's a lot of pent up demand. So we have SDKs around. We, have, we just finished the next JS billing app. We just, we have a Mac SDK. We have types, uh, JavaScript and TypeScript SDK. So that all came from, again, asking the, you know, asking our, our base, what do you need now that we're in, we have that luxury. Now we can ask, we get, we get responses, we get the, the feedback we need. And with enough pent up demand, it made sense for us to create those things and, and to carve out resources to build those. So as things come up like that, I think that's how we kind of balance that. I will say this though, and I don't know if you want to get into this, but there is a lot of exciting things coming up for lemon squeezy that relate to open source as well. So, but that's how we, that's how we think about it. And, and Laravel is obviously big in like the SaaS building world. So it, it made sense for us to, to lean into this one. What's coming up. What's new people want to know JR. <laughs> no, they, <laughs> yeah. no, I think yeah. High level we've got the marketplace is, is obviously the most anticipated, most exciting thing. That'll be huge because we have, so many affiliates and we have so many existing products that I think will open up a whole new source of traffic. So this isn't necessarily about us. It's about the merchants and making them be more successful, successful with lemon squeezy. I think that's the thing that I'm most excited about is waking up every day and realizing that we're helping people make money, doing what they love. And now we can help them make more sales in the product. I think that that's super mm. exciting on the open source side. There's a project that we've, we kind of kept under wraps that we're going to start teasing that's called wedges and the wedges is a play on word with lemons, right? Like all the wedges that come together and with, it's going to be like a design, an open source design system with coded, you know, components with tailwind and all that. So you can just rapidly come in, create, grab any of the open source wedges that you want, whether it's design or coded components, they're all done. Like the repo that we have called wedges, we've actually, hired a new person to come into the team and that is all they're focused on with Orman is the wedges project. And we're going to release it on lemon squeezy as the, you know, brought to you by lemon squeezy. And I'm, my hope is that it just becomes a massive thing for people that are building. Right. And it speeds up their, their build time. Then they integrate lemon squeezy for their payments. And within a week they can launch whatever they want. Right. So we're just speeding up all that stuff, giving back, making it easier and it's all free. I think that that's like, is there anything better like than that? You know, is it, <laughs> like, that's amazing. It's amazing. And it's all designed I, by Orman. The, your branding and marketing is great. Yeah. Wedges. I, I love how yeah. it ties in. <laughs> well, when are we getting Orman on the pod? He's, he's just this mysterious fe person to me. Yeah, he's way cooler than me. I'll tell you that. And he sounds way better than me. He'll like, he'll serenade you with his voice. But I need to... 
We need to do it. I think he was working on like a mic and things, but we're going to do this. We're going to bring Orman on and tell his story. Working on a mic? I will drive to him and <laughs> deliver him a mic, JR. There's yeah. no working that needs to be done. I don't have to do the camera setup with with him where you're thousands of miles away. I will drive to him and I will make the podcast happen. We should. We'll do it. This is be our goal. There, this will be the win for the year of the Make Lemonade there's podcast. There's no escape. Yeah. We're, we're not. We're on the same island here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> with open source like what why does it matter for companies to invest in open source i mean i think it ta- i think it talks a lot about like th- i guess the org itself you know and and what's mm. what's important to them and it's also like selfishly there is a play right which is it is a marketing play it allows us to have mm. a project that we're working on that's evergreen the content is consistent we just we just release these components this week next week we just release these components it's right it's a constant wheel right of outreach that we can enforce it's a uh it's a feel good back to the community thing and i think it hopefully invites people into lemon squeezy through a new channel right developers and designers coming in and finding lemon squeezy that way and exposing them to lemon squeezy through that lens i think is really powerful versus Someone coming in that's looking up sales tax compliance and <laughs> how to get out of that nightmare, and then they find them and squeezy, right? This is someone that's trying to build, move fast, iterate, prototype, you know, MVP, SLC, whatever you want to call it, and they get exposed to lemon squeezy this way. I think that that's what's most exciting and why open source can can do that, you know, for yeah. for a brand. Yeah, the honest, open way to put it. And yeah. f- I will say on the marketplace as well, I'm very excited for that because you've mentioned it a few times before but it just clicked in my brain that i know i got a bunch of sales from gumrose marketplace mm-hmm. and it was because there was a little bit of extra distribution yeah. built in to the product and if you can get people through your marketplace extra distribution money value which like offsets fees shall we yeah. say then it's a no-brainer right so i can see why you're building that. i'm excited to get yeah. extra free money from the marketplace <laughs> yeah exactly (laughs) so yeah and we and honestly too like we have you know we have a domain now that's just from an seo standpoint like it's gonna it ranks for so well right so i'm excited from an seo side all the marketing stuff that's coming for lemon squeeze is going to be huge we we Mm -hmm. haven't invested in that so i can't even imagine where that's going to take us but that's super exciting for us so one more thing i want to ask you and i might not put this in the episode but i saw a tweet that someone was questioning the fees uh, Mm. where it goes up and up and as you grow you're getting into seven to ten percent fees and they're like it's not feasible it's cheaper at this point just to hire an accountant and you stripe with the thresholds on how do you deal with like people growing and their fees potentially being substantial yeah i mean i think well let me answer it this way so there's depending on even the price of their product, right? There's a lot of people that come in and sell $5 widgets and they're not counting for the 50% 50 cent transaction fee. So <laughs> we'll quickly be like, Hey guys, hold on a second. Like let's adjust your transaction fee. That doesn't make any sense. We'll, we'll, we'll knock that down. So you're not, you know, they calculate that into the percentage and that's what skews that. There's also people that get paid out via PayPal. PayPal has crazy fees to get paid out and we don't charge anything. We just, we, but we do pass those on, which are, you know, listed in our docs. So that can create a bit of chaos. But to answer the question, like, obviously as people scale, we give rate breaks, right? Volume-based discounts. That's a thing. And, uh, you know, we haven't done a great job of this. We do have a compare Stripe page we haven't released yet, but, and I'm not knocking Stripe because I obviously love Stripe. But they have the same fees. If you go and add, I say this all the time, if you just, you're just looking at the listing price of payments, but when you add fraud prevention and sales tax and everything else that they do, you're paying seven and nine percent. Plus, now you're having to remit all the taxes yourself. You don't get the global affiliate network. You won't get soon the marketplace. There's so many things that, you know, kind of come with it. Plus, you have to build everything from scratch. So if you want to do, usage-based billing you got to build that if you want to do subscription you got to pay for that half a percent plus you have you know what i mean so it's all it's all there right but 
each to their own. You know what I mean? If it, I think it's good for optionality. I think it's good that people have options and there's just different value that I think we're adding. That's more than just, yeah. Payment processing, you know? Yeah. Well, but do, do, do you have an idea of what products are being sold most through Lemon Squeezy or is it just a full gamma across SaaS, info products, Notion templates, whatever? Yeah, it's, it's pretty, I mean, no, there's good pockets of SaaS based products. There's Mac applications using license keys and the SDK. And there's, there's a lot of template, a lot of framer templates is big. Notion templates mm. is big. And yeah, and then info based stuff is is there. Yeah, I mean it's it's a good gambit, which I think is what's so exciting about the marketplace. Is there's gonna be so many categories. So mm. you can shop so many different things, which is I don't know, that's pretty amazing. So And it that's is. my background. That's where I came from. I built, you know, the world's well one of the biggest WordPress marketplaces. So I'm excited to kind of open that back up, you know? Cool. Well, JR, I think it's been a really interesting entertaining episode thank you for answering some of the listener questions and some of my questions at the end there anything else you want to add or should we wrap it here yeah let's wrap it i think this is a good episode hopefully we kind of got all the i I, you know we have some like things we can cut out to shorten it down but you know i think for the most part we got the things in that we wanted all right let's wrap it and next week we've got aaron francis on the pod Mm. yeah it's exciting i like him Thank you for listening to this episode of Make Lemonade. If you enjoyed the conversation, make sure you hit the subscribe or follow button on the podcast player of your choice. We always appreciate reviews. If you want to make your own lemonade stand like many of these creators, you can check out Lemon Squeezy. We'll put all links in the show notes. Okay, all right.